بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على شرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم السلام عليكم and good afternoon everyone welcome back to this uh, new session in our international OBE symposium 2022 the theme for this uh, symposium is non-conventional teaching and learning activities in the engineering education from the OBE perspective so uh, this is our second day and now we are approaching the end of this symposium. Uh, we have very fruitful time uh, since yesterday. We have, uh, yeah, we are honored to have uh, very good presenters. And uh, I think that the, the outcome of this uh, is, is, is very good to everyone. Uh, so this is our last technical session, I would say. And this is a panel discussion that includes number of, of, the, of experts in uh, engineering education. Uh, the chair for this session will be Professor uh, Hasib, uh, Professor Muhammad Abdul Hasib. Uh, and if you allow me, I will take just one or two minutes to briefly introduce Professor Hasib, who is going to uh, take the control of this, of this session. So uh, Prof Hasib uh, has graduated from uh, has graduated from the from Bangladesh from, from the University of Engineering and Technology, and his degree was on meteorological engineering. Then he received his PhD uh, in engineering from the Catholic University Leuven in Bel Belgium. Uh, he is currently working as a professor in the Department of Nanomaterials and Ceramic Engineering. This is again in Bangladesh in the University of Engineering and Technology. Before that, uh, he worked as a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the University of Malaya in Malaysia. During that time, he served as the Dean of Innovative Industry and Sustainable Sustainability Research Cluster, uh, that's uh, in UM. Uh, again, he also worked as an active associate vice chancellor for industry and community engagement. Uh, he once served as a uh, as a head of mechanical uh, engineering department. All that is in the University of Malaya. And one last position uh, that before Malaya, yeah, before the University of Malaya, he was also professor of, uh, at the Department of Ma Materials and Meteorological Engineering. Uh, his research interests covered nanostructures for gas sensing applications. Uh, electronic packaging materials and degradation of materials in, in hostile environment. He is uh, an editor of number of uh, publications that include Encyclopedia of Materials uh, and also the Journal of Research Governance and Management, uh, Advances in Materials and Processing Technology, and lastly, we have the AS ASEAN Engineering Journal. He is very active internationally and he is engaged in, in multiple activities. He is a research fellow at the Oxford University. He is also a fellow at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, that's in Germany. He is an invited uh, scientist in GSPS research, and that's his uh, Kyushu University in Japan. Uh, he is also a visiting, a visiting research fellow at the University of La Plata, is in Argentina. Uh, he is also a member of the Institute of Mechanical Engineering in UK. He is a chartered engineer by the Engineering Council, also in, in the United Kingdom. He is a member of Minerals, Metals and Materials Society in the, US, in the USA. And he's also a member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics uh, Engineering. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite Professor Hasib uh, to chair this session. So please, Prof, uh, take control of the session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Elstey, for your too generous introduction. You could have shortened this. In any case, I think uh, I welcome you all uh, to, this, uh, symp uh, to this symposium and to the panel discussion session that we are holding today. I think this panel discussion is being held in the office of 
very successful uh, International OBE Symposium 2022. And it is as successful as the first one, of which I had the privilege uh, of participating. Theme of this symposium is non conventional teaching and learning activities in the engineering education from the OBE perspective. We have seen quite a number of very good presentation, uh, fabulous uh, that covers quite wide range of possibilities of using these non-conventional approaches to, to our engineering education. There are discussion on capstone project, uh, PP, PS model uh, as used in Canada. We also saw a UK PSF uh, model we have, uh, we have seen use of metacognition in education. There were discussion on problem-based and project-based learning, flipped classroom, augmented reality. So we have seen quite a wide range of uh, choices that our uh, educators have presented to us. And this is the backdrop where I would like to uh, ask our panelists to give their uh, valuable opinion on this. But before I proceed, let me officially introduce the distinguished panelists that we have here today. We are fortunate to have uh, uh, Professor Megat Mohammad Noor. I will introduce him in a while. We also have uh, Professor uh, Yulfian Aminanda. Aminanda. We have uh, Professor Krishna Vedula. I welcome all of you who have uh, quite a successful career in their own areas. Uh, I read the CV, uh, then I think I will not be able to finish uh, today. So I will very briefly introduce uh, each one of you. Uh, Professor Megat Johari, Megat Mohammad Noor, uh, all of us know him who were in uh, Malaysia. So he was a professor in uh, University Technology Malaysia, but he's very well known for leading figure in taking Malaysia to the Washington Accord and getting the uh, full uh, status. He was also instrumental in getting the accession uh, to the Sydney and Dublin Accords. And he has been very, very active in this area. He's the board the Board of Engineers Malaysia since 2017. is uh, chairing some of the key committees there, Examination and Qualification Community uh, Committee. He's also Deputy Chair of Engineering Technology Accreditation Council. currently the President and Fellow of the Malaysian Society for Engineering and Technology. We have our speaker, our panel member, uh, Professor Dr. Engineer Yunfian Aminanda. Uh, Professor Aminanda, he started his career as uh, an engineer in the aerospace industry. Uh, he then worked as the head of the department in Indonesian aerospace industry. Later on, he also served uh, the Boeing company in Seattle for quite some time. Later on, he switched his profession and entered into the education. So he started lecturing in the International Islamic University of Malaysia in uh, 2005. Uh, currently, uh, Professor Amina is the Dean School of Designs, UTB, Brunei, Dar es Salaam. Uh, he has published uh, a good number of papers 67 and has a total citation of 710 and an H index of 10. And he also served as uh, deputy dean of research uh, at the Faculty of Engineering, UTB. We have Professor Krishna Vedula has a very distinguished career. He spent 40 years in engineering education in the US, devoting his time as uh, in the Indo Universal Collaboration for Engineering Education. Uh, Professor Vedula served in many uh, 
banking universities in the US, including Case Western Reserve University, Iowa State University, University of Massachusetts, Loyal. He also spent time serving in different uh, national bodies in the US, including the US National Science Foundation, US Office of Naval Research, NASA Lewis Research Center. Professor Vedula has been very active in international engineering education. He was the president of the International Federation of Engineering Education Societies, awarded quite a number of awards. I will just mention a couple of them. So he was awarded the title of International Engineering Educator Honoris Causa in Fired Egypt or IGIPHC. I'm not sure if I did, uh, uh, if I pron uh, pronounced them correctly. And that was given by World Engineering Education Forum in 2014. Professor is also uh, chief editor uh, of a journal uh, which deals with engineering education. The title of the journal is Journal of Engineering Education Transformation. With this brief introduction, I'd like to invite uh, our panelists to present. And before I do that, uh, let me go back to the coordinator, Professor Elsay. So how do you suggest us to move forward, Professor Elsay? <clears throat> Uh, okay, so uh, I think each of the panelists can take uh, some time to share uh, their valuable experience and to comment and give feedback uh, about the presentation that they have attended. Uh, if they have time to attend some of these presentations. So feedback, share experience, and also uh, we encourage the, the other, other attendees to share their questions uh, so that the, 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 our panel members can, can answer some of the questions, hopefully answer all the questions that we have uh, today, inshallah, from our audience. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, let's move uh, with uh, Professor Megat Zuhari first. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, if I can share a short presentation before uh, Please. we proceed. Go ahead. And if I can share my screen. Can you disable sharing? Uh, I mean, enable sharing, sorry. You I'll can try now. Prof, you can try now. Try okay. to share uh, slides. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, I, I can. Okay. okay. I think I'd like to start off with the Chinese proverb. Um, it says, I listen and I forget, I see and I remember. I do and I understand, although I cannot really pronounce it in Chinese. Uh, but what it does is that uh, it tells us about the way that students actually learn, uh, how best they can learn. And in fact, by doing it, they will understand better. Um, then if we look at it, what's important here is that uh, at the end of the day, what will be the role of the academic staff? They're supposed to step back so that the students can actually act. And, and if we look at the learning pyramid, um, the lesser the interaction of the academic staff in allowing the students to actually take their initiative to learn, the better it is in terms of their retention. That means learning by doing. So in fact, we have been talking a lot about the non-conventional way of delivering or the pedagogy non-conventional pedagogy in terms of trying to get learning to take place the most important thing is to get the students to take charge of their learning now uh, what i intend to add a bit is do we really understand our students how they learn uh, we may actually develop a methodology that would focus on learning outcomes but at the end of the day, we had lots of probably complaints. You know, the students are still not learning despite us applying different methods, different pedagogy to make sure that they learn. So it could have been, uh, it does not match with the learning style. 
one of the things that if you look at um, how do we look at things, our perception, it could be as a sensor or somebody who is very intuitive. Now, for example, if you look at the ladies, they are more intuitive than the boys who tends to, to like to have a feel of things, uh, to, to be able to touch things so that they can actually learn. So they get doing it. Right? Whereas there are other input modality, some of the students are very much verbal, some are more visual. If they can see, they can actually learn better. Or if they actually discuss, they actually um, deal with the issues in terms of the discussion, most likely they will learn better. On the other hand, how they process all this information, some are very active, some are more reflective. Uh, so you find that um, someone who is intuitive are more reflective in nature, where they tend to say, let's take you know, some time um, to reflect on matters before we actually proceed on the work. Whereas an active person would say, okay, let's jump into it. Let's do some kind of trial and error. You know, that's the way that they learn and they would learn and they would be more interested in learning. And on the other hand, some people are more sequential as compared to being global. They would like to see the, the sequential would like to see the information in bits and pieces and it comes in sequence. Whereas the global person would want to see everything before they can actually understand whatever actually comes to them. So these are the different learning styles. So have we actually, when we consider the, the different methods that we have been saying all this while, are we considering the learning styles of our students? And being academics, of course, this is something that we have to uh, make sure that we are uh, in that position. It's just like this uh, caricature, which is uh, actually saying that, uh, you know, uh, for a fish to climb the tree, it's almost impossible, isn't it? Or impossible. But that doesn't mean that uh, maybe it is because we are not actually giving the appropriate environment for a person to actually grow in terms of their intellectuals. Now, there are a number of pedagogical principles, one would say, uh, when we develop all this uh, non-conventional method of learning. For example, uh, we know that active learning is something that we need to push forward whereby there's a lot of collaboration, there's a lot of interaction. So whether our pedagogy actually allows that collaboration as well as interaction, that's one of the things that we need to consider. Secondly, are there a lot of engagements uh, whereby we introduce case method learning, we may actually introduce real life uh, conditions in terms of learning to take place. So these are something that engage the student and at the same time, motivate them to actually to learn more. So are we actually applying those principles, really? Uh, on diversity and flexibility, do we allow students who may take longer time to actually learn uh, within the group? There are stragglers a bit. There are those who are excellent that can move forward. But then again, it, it could have been because of the learning style. Some are stragglers, not because they do not have that intellectual capability. So these are things that uh, we need to also consider. And then when we talk about the academic socialization, what are the support that we actually provide to the students? No doubt we have that pedagogy, but do we, do, do we really provide those kind of supports that enable them to actually learn better? Uh, personal development integrity. Uh, this is something that if we look at uh, the way that we teach, we may actually focus on the technicalities, on the technical contents of it, but less of trying to bring the aspects of ethics, responsibility, sort of infused within our teaching. So do we really uh, get that pedagogy right, but at the same time, introduce this aspect within that pedagogy? And of course, challenging the students. Uh, we know that there are extremely good students, top universities, middle universities, and so on. But are we really challenging academically? Or are we meeting the minimum? You see, as far as accreditation is concerned, it is always the minimum that you have to meet. But for universities, are they actually trying to meet the minimum or pushing the boundaries, challenging the students? I think these are amongst the things that 
when we talk about the pedagogy, we need to actually include these aspects to make sure that we are actually delivering what is required. Now, if you look at the cone of learning at Gadales, we talk about retention time. I mean, how much can we retain, re retain that knowledge? So usually after two weeks, uh, most of the time, students would have forgotten what they may have read. So about 10% probably they will remember what they have read, 20% probably what they have heard, and then 30% if they have seen it. And combining them about half, that means to say 50% of what they had actually seen or hear, they are able to actually retain those kind of knowledge. As uh, I started off with the Chinese proverb just now, if they start doing it, right, or if they actually get really involved and even teach others on those methods, that kind of pedagogy would enable them to actually retain almost the maximum, about 90% within that two weeks that we talk about and forever, really. So that becomes their latent knowledge. So all in all, we are looking at, uh, we are actually moving, that means to incorporate more of the learning by doing as compared to mostly verbal as well as visual and if we really see we are moving from passive to active and if we look at what's happening right now uh, with the virtual environment that we have recently with the pandemic the e-learning modules adaptive pre-assessment and all those mobile learning they are actually covering the top part of it which is only about 10 to 20 percent retention then again, if you look at the labs, the exercises or gamification, as we have seen this, this morning, capstone, as well as community involvement, these are the ones that actually develops and retain the knowledge of the students much longer. So those are the kind of uh, methods that we should actually try to employ, but not forgetting the learning styles of the students where we need to do some kind of a, an adjustment to ensure that students really learn from the process. Now, there's one uh, pedagogy that actually attracts me, actually, uh, because we are actually producing engineers. And think about, we are pro producing professionals, that means as engineers, or experts, what we may say. Um, but in doing that, we would like, as we know, being professionals, it, it involves the mind, heart, as well as your ability to use your limbs, basically. Um, but we are not training them just for the purpose of marketable skills. We are actually trying to build character out of these graduates. Because being professional is not just about having that knowledge, not just about having the skills. But it is more than that, it's the character building that actually with knowledge, skills and ethics, they are professionals at the end of the day professional invent engineers, technicians and technologists, if at that level. So these are the different levels uh, one may want to consider. Uh, but if you look at being an expert, expert in what? They have an analytical mind, really. Whatever they do at the end of the day, they are very analytical in the way that they approach. So if the pedagogy actually allows that ability for a person to be able to articulate, to be able to be more analytical in their approach, then you are actually producing the right kind of graduates. And of course, we can progress from novice right up to the expert level. And one of the things that I really appreciate very much, which I used to do this when I was still at the university, it is about the program organized project work, POPBL. I'm sure many of you have actually uh, gone through them or even uh, implemented them. It always start with the problems, right? That means identification of problems where they would need to analyze them in order to actually solve the problem. Therefore, they may have to do some literature. They have to do some research work. That means to look at information. And then there are times that we give lectures. Maybe we space them so that something that is condensed can actually be done uh, at a different interval so that it gives a better grounding especially on condensed material um, so these lectures could be short but they are very effective so we are not talking about having a typical uh, conventional way of doing things in the past just all lectures and labs eh? 
And at the same time, we can also enable studies in groups. Remember, if we talk about active learning, we would like to see groupings. We would like to see students working in groups, in teams rather, collaboration as well as uh, cooperation. So that's one way of getting the collaboration and cooperation to take place through these group studies in solving the problem. At the same time, there could be tutorials. Maybe your, your tutorials that you provide strengthen the theoretical understanding of the graduates, really. And they may have to go to field work to actually verify things, to get more information. And at the same time, they may actually conduct experiments, right? And to make sure that they are able to have that proof of concept sometimes um, be something that would actually grant them better learning at the end of the day. So in doing so, at the end of the day, they will have to produce a report. They will have to communicate whatever they have done, the sort of results that they do get. So this approach uh, seems to be very much actually producing someone. Uh, remember, at the end of the day, while we are doing this, the ethical, the sustainability, all those issues can come into the picture and making sure that we are really solving complex problems using this methodology, despite uh, there are numerous of them that are available. But then again, there is always the requirements that we need to look at, a high degree of supervision, office space. Uh, you have to constantly change your lectures with time as well, with the changing uh, issues and so on. And there should be flexibility in the distribution of your resources. So for the person who is actually leading this team, they must make sure that they have the right pedagogical skills, the scientific skills, time management, and of course, if they have the research that they are doing, it should trickle down to their students. Uh, one last thing that I would like to say is the communal pedagogy. You know, all the while we've been listening to individuals talking about um, the course, but actually all those courses make a program. Now, if we really want something at the end of the day that would be useful for the graduates, it should somehow reinforce the learning. And if you have a consistent practice, which means to say if you are adopting some kind of an agreed communal pedagogy, the approach may be, you know, just a few rather than myriads of all these pedagogies, you may be able to reinforce and strengthen them. For example, if you stick to case method learning, you possibly would produce students who are able to articulate, who are able to actually solve problems. I mean, if you reinforce them, or that means to say all the courses are applying that method, you'll find that that becomes their yeah, second nature as far as students in solving problems. So that's the kind of communal pedagogy that the approach that should be considered rather than having myriads of non-conventionals. Uh, last but not least, um, since we are talking about engineering, I would just like to highlight when it comes to, I know when we are doing all this OBE, at the end of the day, there will be an organization that will actually then uh, evaluate whether you are on the right track or not. And most importantly, you have to make sure that they are engineering and if you look at that line between skills and knowledge, the pedagogy that we're going to approach very much depends on how much skills and how much knowledge that we are actually trying to give our students. So for engineering, you'll find that most of the practical skills will be much less compared to the technologies or the technicians or even the skills. That means above the line, you have more skills. Below the line, you have more knowledge. So you do find uh, sometimes engineering technology may actually go towards engineering. Similarly, it may also go towards technician. And generally, it, it goes towards those directions because of sometimes the way that we employ our pedagogy. So similarly with engineering, it may actually go to the verge that you may turn your program not being engineering, but rather engineering technology. So that's where the danger is. And last but not least, I just would like to share to you, we need to actually have that pedagogy that is actually solving complex problems. 
and of course solving complex problem requires all those last but not least to say the problem characteristics would require a lot of um, pedagogy that is allowing um, the instructor to include as much different fields of study to be included for example conflicting issues there is no obvious solution infrequently encountered and at the same time we are talking about sustainability and so on that we can actually incorporate i think this is the challenge uh, if we look at the program yes overall the programs may have it but if you look at the at the courses sometimes the courses may be working in silos and it doesn't actually interact with the rest of courses that develops into a program and produce a graduate at the end of the day thank you very much i think that's uh, this is an exemplar that is the latest coming from uh, the International Engineering Alliance under Washington Accord. I think uh, I'll end with the, the teachers actually open the door, you enter by yourself. And studying the past helps to understand the present. These are amongst the things that the philosophy that we, if we could incorporate them, actually it would enable our, our students to actually be one who is really articulate and critical in many areas and having the right knowledge in the area that they are actually practicing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mega, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, really give the essence of what engineering education and the required pedagogy. Uh, so you, if I can start from the end where we started, so engineers have to solve complex problem and to learn this, uh, just is not enough. So we have to have uh, adequate support uh, for the students and that support will come from pedagogy, uh, which will teach them how to do complex engineering problems, how to solve those. And as you have mentioned that uh, in order to do that, we have to let the student do these things, not just listen. And we have to uh, do pedagogy that involves not just verbal, but also visual. You also mentioned that in order to achieve this, some of the successful techniques uh, that you have used uh, is uh, one of them is POPBL, problem, a project oriented problem based learning. Communal pedagogy is also the one that you have uh, mentioned today. Above all, you have highlighted that it's not just the skill, we have to incorporate character in our students. So I think that is a key message that I got from you. Thank you so much. Uh, before I uh, uh, entertain any question, probably what I will do is to listen to all our distinguished panel members first, and then we will open it for question. Uh, next, our speaker is uh, Professor Ulfian Aminanda. So Professor Aminanda, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. So I think I can share again the uh, screen like Prof may get uh, do it. Can you see? Can you see this? The files? Ah, uh, yes, I can. I can see very well. Okay, so first of all, I think thank, thank you very much for inviting me. And basically, I follow. I mean, somehow all the some of the presentations before, and who proposing the new innovations way to do it. Uh, some of them using uh, softwares which uh, uh, very interesting and also maybe it can uh, uh, call it inculcate or uh, engage the uh, uh, the active uh, the creativity of the student assessment but i think uh, i would like to uh, i would like to present it here on the practical uh, side of it uh, basically uh, uh, there is two things that i want to uh, i want to emphasize here one on the OBE itself, so all right. Uh, the, what is the OBE? I will not go through uh, into the detail because Promega has has been uh, presenting. And then, what is the industry requirement? Uh, or uh, somehow, since we have a lot of uh, discussion with industry, so I know some some input from them, which is uh, quite uh, interesting to 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 put it to integrate it into into the way we uh, deliver the teaching learning deliveries in in the. In the, in the universities. So first of all, I think as I said, just maybe this one, uh, 
uh, just repeat repetition from Prof. Prof. Megat. The aim here, the, the essence here is now is student center. So the students should somehow discover by themselves. We just got coaching and then they are they will learn it by doing it and so, and so forth. So we need uh, whatever whatever the uh, the uh, the way that uh, even innovative way to do it. But if it's not at the end of the day, the students who, who, who will do it or become a student center, I think the OB is not, not, not achieved, right? I think it should be like students discover uh, anyway by themselves, by doing by themselves, then we are, we are only coaching it. That's the first thing. So first to be student center, just to come back to OBE. And the second one, just to, because this one, I think Prof. Megat has uh, uh, presented, I just go, 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 uh, go very fast. And this kind of here, concern from industry. So when I, I during my professional uh, uh, professional activities as education in Malaysia, Indonesia, in France, and so in, uh, in Brunei now, there's a concern from industry. When the uh, graduates uh, come to the industry, even in the interview process, somehow they they don't have the uh, kind of they don't understand the basic of the engineering knowledge. It means when they ask something, how you how you solve the problem, and, they and suddenly they ask, okay, I will do the software. The software we will put on the on the element and so on, right? So they they started they started right away on the uh, kind of on the detailed design of it. Uh, there is no such like how they be able to formalize the problem. It means how to analyze a complex problem to do to do much more analyze it, so we can strategize the solutions. Right? That that can is uh, even though I believe that we are all teaching them, but somehow it's missing. Uh, it's missing because it nowadays it seems to me uh, we are more emphasized on giving. Uh, solutions through softwares, finite elements, Darnley, and so forth, and then uh, whereby when they 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 create the the model before, they they are losing the 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 assumption of it. They are using the basic knowledge of it. Therefore, they just know the results without knowing exactly what's the input. Why they they put they put input on it. That's the first thing I think the industry uh, giving giving the uh, giving the uh, input to us, and then after this, as I said before, from that one after strategy solution and formalize the problem, they are not able to somehow give a, a very first or very global solutions using their their approach uh, applying the basic engineering knowledge. It's always like okay with this, then we go to the software, we put input, and the uh, result will be will be doing it. We, uh, uh, it is my, basically uh, I was in industry. It's not the way we do it. So we have to be able to propose. We have to scratch the solutions and making us uh, basic calculations and propose, knowing the feeling of how what the solution will be, the size and so on, so forth. Right. So this is missing again by uh, from the industry. And then as well, the result as well. So since I think they are not trained to do a um, conceptual calculation or conceptual design, when they put it all in the software and the result, they, they don't even have a feeling whether the magnitude are, are the right one, for example. Right, let's say something they have a displacement or, uh, or the thermal distribution with a certain magnitude, they don't even, I mean, they cannot, say or decide or appraise whether the, 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 those magnitude are basically make sense because they are never doing it in the in the conceptual design so these two concerns basically what we what i do about what we do and what i did in class so i propose the delivery I, 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 I mean i put it into into a, a strategy which is one on the normal courses module which is module my module i will do the semi-guided problem solving so this one basically, uh, as Prof. Megat said, uh, uh, proposed it, is a group discussions within the class. So let's say after one chapter, a specific topic theoretically has been delivered, then we try to solve a problem, complex problem, and then the students should discuss among them, themselves. So uh, uh, we are as a lecturer, only as a, a um, what do you call it, as a facilitator. So with this, basically, they have to. We we try to tell them 
not directly, but by doing it, the step by step of uh, are how doing it. So in, with this, they know exactly how what the steps, and we know exactly what they are not uh, really grabs at which steps they don't. I mean, they don't understand it. So we know exactly what in, in which steps they they are not really clear, have a clear idea on that one. Then you can coach them and then uh, push to the to the uh, to the complete solutions. All right. So that's the first thing. Right? So we do it through semi guided through this uh, discussion in class and also in uh, in uh, uh, in a uh, control time basically what i do I, I just replace the tutorial with this problem solving so we have like one one hour one and a half and two hours so at the end of the two hours we collected the the results and we, we assess it so uh, individually yeah, of course so that's the first thing on the on the course so one example very very clear so we have to do like all the steps, uh, support reaction, internal loading, stress, uh, principal, principal stresses, failure criteria, and so forth. So with this, basically, students can can somehow uh, develop their, their understanding by doing it uh, through a, a group discussion on the class. The second one on the uh, on the more on the uh, higher level, which is let's say on the project basis, like Professor Megat said. So. Uh, we need to basically when we are doing the project or group project, for example, we need to emphasize on uh, emphasize really what has been done in the design uh, processes processes industry. So we, uh, this is one of the one of the steps. So the most important thing I said before, which is lacking, is on the ideations and the conceptual design. So we we somehow jump this directly to detail design. So I I, 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 I I can I can say also for several several uh, meetings several review with the lecturer. So even as it depends also I think it depends also on the on the on the area. So sometimes somehow we always jump this part. So from the problem statement and directly to choosing one sketch and going to detail detail design. Right. So somehow they are doing directly with the software. So here, when we are doing conceptual design and ideation, it's very important, which is very, very much appreciated by industry, which should be done, basically. So ideation, basically, we have to, to be able, the students should be able to reduce the, uh, the complex problem into ideal one, which is, at the end of the day, we can do it at conceptual design by calculating whatever needed through using the basic uh, engineering knowledge. So this concept of design, then we can say, okay, question one, two, three, four, then we can compare it, but we need to, to do a, 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 the students need to do, a, what do you call it, a first approach of calculation. Therefore, they know exactly what they are waiting in, in, uh, in terms of uh, magnitude of the result. It, it could be uh, sizing, it could be thermal and so So uh, what, what we do, so we, after this, then detail design, all right? It could be uh, one one I have uh, we choose it then to the design. It could be using software and so on. Design validation using experimental testing, also using infinite element and so on, and refinement so on. So iteration. So we what what I do what I do normally in in the class. So I have to make sure that all these steps are are followed by the students. Okay. So uh, I ask them to, for a certain time to come up with the ideations. Another one, the conceptual design, design, detail design. If there is iteration, they have to go back again here. And the design validation, refinement, and the necessary iteration. So the idea is we have to be able to follow it, all the steps, right? So that's why I do like week one, two, three. So I, uh, I give the students, so we will have a certain test or assessment at certain uh, weeks, at a certain time within the, within the semesters or two semesters. Which we we'll, which we really emphasize assess every steps of of the of the of the design process. Uh, this is in order the students not to jump the the uh, the process, and just to make sure that they follow exactly the process uh, of design, which will normally uh, should be carried on in, in industry. Right. So then assessment will be following on it. Right, uh, the the one maybe may be the product evaluation through demonstration is by the team evaluator from industry, for example, which is very very interesting to do it. Okay, so 
I think that's all that I want to to emphasize here. First, basically, what I, what I will do is very important, very important to do uh, that the students do it by themselves, doing uh, by doing it either in groups, discussions in the class, in any level of the courses. And the second one, we uh, we need to uh, emphasize the students in every step of the design process. Right. For example, just to make sure that the first part, which is very important on the conceptual and at the, at the educations, and say to, to, to know exactly the magnitude of, of the product at the end of the day after the detailed design are, 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 are well known at the beginning. And that's, uh, I think that's all for the moment. There's some, some project, and I think it's better later on we go through the discussions of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Aminanda, for, for your nice presentation. And uh, I think we also get uh, the main message, uh, which is very similar to uh, Professor Megat. So uh, Professor Aminanda ended uh, by saying that students must do it themselves. So that is the pedagogy I, I think we have to put emphasis on, not just lecturing them. Uh, you also mentioned the detail of the course that you have been teaching on design. And one thing that you mentioned that in some cases, the student missed this conceptual design. Am, am I right? Yes. That, yeah. I think that is yeah. the most innovative step and I couldn't agree with you more because in my yeah. experience, also, I see it all the time. Thank you. I think we will have some good discussion. So let me go to the next uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Krishna Vedula. Professor Krishna, the floor is yes, yours. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, so I think the screen, I, do, I don't have any slides, so whoever is sharing the screen can just stop sharing. Uh, Professor. Yeah. Oh, I need to stop. Yeah, you can stop sharing. I'm sharing your screen. Stop okay, sharing. Okay, which one? Uh, what should I do? Stop sharing. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm I'm just gonna talk. Okay, no, no slides, no PowerPoint presentations. Okay. Uh, so the disadvantage of being third is that everything that needs to be said has been already said. <laughs> okay. So uh, so I will share with you some of my uh, experiences in the last um, few years working with many engineering colleges all over India. Yeah, because that is what. Um, my passion is today, we, I, I run this organization called Indo-Universal Collaboration for Engineering Education. And we have uh, more than 50 colleges in the, you know, that we try to help. So I visit these colleges and, uh, and I say, okay, I want, to, I want to talk to your faculty, okay? And usually I say, okay, bring together about 50, 100 faculty. And uh, the first question I ask them, is uh, have you has anybody taken a course in how to teach? Has any of you taken a course in how to teach? Right. I'm now going to ask the same question to 34 people that are in the room here today. Has any of you taken a course on how to teach? Raise your hand. <laughs> you did. Okay. So this is the typical reaction I would get. Maybe a short course, maybe. So anyway, so this is the situation I was in for many, many years. I taught for 40 years in the United States since I was HOD and Dean and all that also, a lot of research, et cetera. But after about 15 years of teaching, the conventional way, whatever you want to call the conventional way, the lecture mode and you know, do things that we all normally do as professors. I came to the conclusion that um, I'm teaching, but they are not learning, okay? I asked myself a very basic question. I am teaching, are they learning? So that became the mantra of IUCE. I asked faculty, I asked all of them in this, maybe 1,500 people right here. I am teaching, are they learning, okay? That's really the, the crux of outcome-based education, right? You're teaching and you want the outcome to be learning of some sort, right? So that's OBE, outcome-based education. So for the most part, I think faculty will, will not be sure. They might pretend that they're learning, since they're learning, but for the most part, students are not learning. So I said, okay, uh, none of you has taken a course in how to teach, right? 
So tomorrow you go on a flight in the airplane, right? And uh, before taking off, the pilot comes to you and says, okay, folks, I'm your pilot, but I have not taken a single course on how to, how to, how to fly. You would quickly run out, out of the, come out of the plane, right? I don't want to fly with this guy. So the problem is that we have never, never really seriously considered um, teaching our teachers how to teach. And so most faculty that get in, they get a PhD or something and go in and somebody says, okay, you're teaching, going to teach this course. Here's the textbook, here's the curriculum, go teach. So if I were to give my keys to my teenage son of my car to my teenage son and say, okay, go drive. You're gonna bash up the car, right? Without learning how to drive. So, uh, so our mantra, I am teaching, are they learning? It becomes a very basic issue that we you know, we try to address, right? So I get in front of this, this um, room, 50 to 100 faculty, and they've all admitted that really haven't taken a course in how to teach. And I say, okay, I am in the same situation. All over the world, engineering faculty have really not taken a single course in teaching. Maybe some of them have taken short courses. So I got introduced to the new way of teaching more con non-conventional way, but which I think should be the conventional way actually, by Richard Felder. Some of you have heard Richard Felder you know, yesterday as a keynote speaker at North Carolina University, State University, effective teaching and learning. So after having taught for 15 years in the conventional way, normal, you know, get up and lecture and I say, blah, 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 whatever we all do normally, mm -hmm. I decided I have to learn how to teach. I attended some of his workshops. And so since that time, I've, I've continued to be learning how to, how to teach and then help other faculty to learn you know, how to teach. So what I do then in this uh, room full of uh, 1,500 people, I say, you know, I, 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 I talk a little bit about the attention span of people, okay? You know, if, if you are in a lecture, sitting in a classroom, somebody's talking, Initial five or 10 minutes, you'll be paying attention, seriously. After 10 minutes, your attention span starts dropping very rapidly. And this is scientifically proven. Research has been done by people who have studied these kinds of things. And so after 10 minutes, the rest of my lecture is wasted, effectively. But we still continue to have these long 15 minute, 20 minute lectures and go on, blah, 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 blah. So PowerPoint slides, PowerPoint slides, talk and talk, right? I tell these folks that you know, this theory, learning pedagogy that we need to understand, teaching and learning pedagogy, as teachers, we need to understand these things before we actually can improve our teaching and do some kind of non-conventional things. There is, for example, Bloom's taxonomy. Okay, and that, there's a whole lot of pedagogy involved there. So what I had them do, I said, okay, I, I told you that this attention span drops after 10 minutes. And right about, this is that about the time when, when I'm addressing the 1500 faculty, it's been 10 minutes, I've been talking to them, right? It says now, okay, now I, I'm gonna stop talking. But if I keep talking, you're gonna fall asleep. It's just like your students will fall asleep in your class after you talk for 10 minutes, blah, 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 right? So what we're gonna do is do a simple in-classroom activity with you all faculty. So the most, uh, most important, most effective technique is creating a dynamic classroom, engaging the students while you're teaching. Okay, so that after 10 minutes of giving some concepts, get them engaged. And I use the very simple process, which again is part of a bunch of different things Richard Felder talks about in, her, in his workshops and so on. Many other people do that. This is called the think, pair, share technique that most of you probably already know, right? So the, this technique is, very few people in colleges and faculty know this technique. It's a very simple technique, but there are many other techniques that you can learn. So I, I tell them, okay, we're gonna use this technique right now in this room of 100 people, okay? So I want each one of you to take the next two, three minutes to reflect, think about Something that you probably have learned, have, have heard about quite a lot because the administrators and all have been talking about it. Everybody's talking about Bloom's taxonomy. 
let's say, think about Bloom's taxonomy. Just to get you started, there are six levels of pedagogy in Bloom's taxonomy. Each one of you now take, think for two minutes. I just now I remain quiet. Okay, because this is after 10 minutes of giving a lecture, I'm getting them to become active. The first part of getting them to become active is for them to think. Otherwise, they're just like zombies sitting there listening to you for 15 minutes. So after 10 minutes of getting becoming like zombie almost, so they say, okay, now you think. I walk around and say, you know, okay, and after that, I'm quiet for two minutes. And they're thinking, okay, Bloom's taxonomy. I've heard about it somewhere. This is this, this is this, okay. So after two minutes, I say, okay, each of you has thought about the six levels of Bloom's taxonomy, or maybe not. You might have forgotten, and that's fine. Now I want you to, everyone, to turn to the person next to you. This is a room full of 100 people, right? As everyone, turn to the person next to you and talk to the person, share with that person, talk to the person about Bloom's taxonomy, what you have recollected in your thinking process, what are the different levels and which are the most, which is the most difficult level to implement in the classroom. I said, talk to the person next to you. They initially, they won't understand what I'm saying, right? After I'll have to go, okay, talk to the person next to you, okay? So, uh, Haseeb, talk to Yulfian next to you, right? And I say, okay, Mega, talk to Sheikh next to you, and so on. So I have to tell people, okay, go around, say, Nashra, talk to Tazna Sibul next to you, okay? That physically, I've got to make it an active classroom. It's a dynamic classroom. I want them to talk and sh with each other about the six levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Some of them know, some of them don't. And therefore, by talking with each other, they kind of reinforce that there are these six levels. And after, after they do that for two or three minutes, the third part of the TPS comes in. Think, pair, share. Third part is sharing. Now, everybody does not have to share. I can, we can do this in a classroom of 50 people or 100 people. So I walk around. Even if it's stadium seating, I can walk around. It's okay. Asib, what did you and uh, Yulfian talk about? Can you share that with the rest of the class? Okay. So Hasib will say, well, you know, I know that I know that there's a basic level is remembering, right? Remembering, that's the first level. Then uh, you'll feel much, okay, the next level is uh, understanding, okay? And, and, and so on, you'll, and, and so you'll explain to me those things for a minute or so, the two of you, okay? Then I will go to, uh, okay, I'll go around to the other side of the room and say, El Sheikh and, and Megat, okay, what did you all talk about? Okay, what did you think is the most difficult mm -hmm. of the six levels? So see, yeah, yeah, there are these higher levels, right? After remembering, you have understanding, then you're applying, and then you have analyzing, evaluating, and finally create, wow. So uh, Megat is very smart, he knew all the levels, right? And then Megat and Shekhar take a turn, I say, okay, which one you know, have you tried to implement any of these levels in your classroom? Yeah, yeah, try a little bit and all that, but but most of the time we are stuck in the lowest levels. Most of the time, our students all the time still mugging up, just memorizing and passing exams because that is the way we are giving them exams, right? Only to test their memory, nothing else. We are not creating exams that will test them out whether they're creative or analytical. At the most, we have exams and stuff that are having people understand second level, but. Many of them, they wait the last two days before the exam, memorize and pass. If they can memorize and pass, there is something wrong with the system. They're able to pass by just memorizing two days before the exam, then they are doing something wrong. We have to change how we teach and how we, how we put exams together, right? So, so, so then that is what you know, Megat and, and, and Sheikh were talking about. So yeah, we had a tough time uh, you know, uh, getting them to uh, get to the higher level of creating, okay? So I do this with three or four pairs and that stirs up the old 100 people, right? Classroom. So this is called the think, pair, share technique that Richard Felder you know, uses a lot in his own live classrooms, even in his online classrooms. And I do this a lot now. It's, very, it's not rocket science, it's very easy. And the, and the, and the, and the, and the basic, you know, theory behind it is the attention span. So if you do, if you if you're teaching a class of maybe 50 minutes, 
think of, you know, give them some concepts in the first 10 minutes. And then for about five minutes, do this think pair share dynamic activity, wakes them up. Okay. And then again, you can give them a little more gyan, a little more, you know, <laughs> stuff for 10 minutes. Again, wake them up. Okay. So you have to intersperse this engaging the students in a way that they start you know, they, uh, interacting with each other. Okay. So, so this is what I do most, you know, anytime I go to school, college, anywhere, anytime I address people, I said, give me 50, 100 people, whatever. And this is what I do with them all the time. Okay. So, I, and, and, and the faculty, I try to emphasize them to say, this is a demonstration of what you can do in your classroom. Very important. You, not very, diff, not very difficult. There's so many other techniques of student-centered teaching and learning, which sometimes are more difficult, like the flipped classroom and other things people talk about, they're a little more, little more difficult, right? Project-based learning, a little more difficult, okay? We'll come to that in a minute. But I said, the basic engaging the students to get them to think and reflect, you know, gets them already to start doing higher level things, okay? So, so then if you, can, if you can, and then and then depending on the course that you're teaching, you can plan these activities in such a way that they could actually get to the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy, analyze, evaluate, might even be able to create something in a short period of time in the classroom, think of something, right? And, and, and this is what is leading to the, the skills that, you know, that the world forums are all saying. We must get the students to do creative thinking, innovative thinking, problem solving, very important. So these, this will happen. These will automatically happen if you start doing some of these kinds of dynamic classroom activities, okay? So the next, piece I want to talk about is if you look at ABET or in India, it's the National Board of Accreditation, I'm sure in Bangladesh, you have one accrediting agency, they have outcomes that you have to show that you've achieved in the four years of undergraduate education, right? Half of those outcomes, whether it's ABET or NBA or some other thing, are non-technical. Half of them outcomes are communication skills, one of them, team skills, project management, ethics, lifelong learning, sustainability, so on, okay, social uh, service. So. But you cannot teach these as separate courses. They can only be taught as part of what some of the previous speakers already talked about, project-based learning, design thinking. So now you get to a different, you know, quite the higher level than just the dynamic classroom, where you actually give students think, to think about a profile, even identifying a problem is a huge learning experience. Give them an open-ended situation, let them identify a problem. As a team, look, you know, talk with the customer, talk to the people who have the problem, and then communicate with each other, communicate with the people who have the problem, and then agree and try to define the problem, do some research, to come with alternate solutions and you analyze the different solutions, compare them, evaluate them, and say, okay, this solution looks like uh, the best possible solution and start implementing it and so on. So, so this whole design thinking process, which again, one of the previous speakers talked about is, a, is a the next level. You know, I mean, dynamic, dynamic classroom is a very basic thing inside the classroom, but then you can do other things other than that. Okay, so, so if you do projects, you automatically they're learning team skills, communication skills, and all the things that are in the ABET you know, listed together, okay? So, so this is you know, the couple of things I wanted to share with you. And let me see if I can uh, see if I uh, wanna... Yeah, the, the, the other thing about, about this, uh, doing the dynamic classroom or some new strategy, I keep emphasizing to the faculty because they have, they get scared, okay? Okay, I can't do that. this dynamic classroom. You know, I can't do things per share. I can't do the other things very easily. So I said, all of these things are, are like riding a bicycle, okay? The first time you try to ride a bicycle, you will fall down. Second time you will fall down. Third time you'll fall down. Fourth time somebody will hold your seat and you'll start running. So try some new things and practice and practice and practice again and again. And most importantly, create a community of practice in your department, in your college, where people are sharing their experiences with each other. So they feel more comforted because, oh, you fell down. Oh, okay, I also fell down, but let's see how, I, how we can both stop falling down, right? And so that sharing community of practice, creating a center for teaching and learning is very important, okay? So, um, 
So with that, I'm going to stop because I think I, I think I think we should give uh, you know, people some time to uh, some time to discuss. And I'm trying to see if I have missed out anything that I made notes of. But uh, yeah, one 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 other quick thing that I wanted to point out is that as part of the Indo Universal Collaboration for Engineering Education, we have designed actually designed a course, which is available for anybody. It's online, okay, so anybody in any country can take it. Uh, we've been running wow. this for the last uh, six years. Uh, in collaboration with um, IGIP. Someone earlier was trying to uh, say, what is this IGIP in my resume? <laughs> okay, that's a, that's a pedagogy, uh, uh, society pedagogy, engineering pedagogy in Austria. So based on a model that they have, we have developed a certification program called the IUC International Edu Engineering Educator Certification Program. Uh, people from all, several, a team of us from all over the world, we offer uh, this in the form of five modules. Okay, and, and, and it's done online, but the important thing is it's not like just online and go to sleep, right? We have, you know, Zoom interactive sessions, chat, poll, assignments. They do assignments on Canvas and they get graded. We hire assistant faculty to grade them, discussion, et cetera. So we make the whole thing as dynamic as possible, even though it's, it's an online program. And, we, and a lot of people get engaged. Five modules. One is first is principles of teaching and learning. How, and again, some several, two couple of speakers before me already went through many of those things, right? You know, how, how, do, how, do people, how do students learn? How to uh, different learning styles and so on, so on, so on, all of that is one module. Okay, and the attention span, all of this comes under that one module. Second module is curriculum design. Starting with the end in mind, starting with the objectives in mind, okay? Design the curriculum and then how to deliver the curriculum. Third is how to deliver the curriculum. And one example is dynamic classroom. Another might be a flipped classroom and so on, okay? And, the, and then uh, how to use technology to make your delivery more effective. And finally, most, most important is assessment, how to set your own quizzes and exams. So this is a one six month program and every week we meet and all do all of these things. So I'm gonna stop there and hand this back to Professor Habib. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bedula for sharing your very valuable experience. Uh, uh, I, I was feeling that I was in a classroom where the teacher <laughs> said that I couldn't sleep anymore. <laughs> Thank you to, to uh, just uh, summarize what you have uh, told us. So just teaching is not important uh, by, by, by itself. It's the learning that is important. And we were told uh, by our elders uh, in our early life of my career, that if the students have not learned, then the teacher has not taught, full stop. And that is the philosophy I think we have to have, all of us. And you highlighted and reminded us of that. You also gave us very practical and low cost method how to keep the student active. It costs practically nothing. And you made us active also in this uh, process, although we are on Zoom now, but I was quite excited. I think you also highlighted that it's not just technical things uh, that constitute engineering education. Half of our outcomes are related to non-technical aspects. And we have to keep that in mind. Just lecturing will not help. And we can start at any time to be a teacher who just doesn't lecture, but also engage students. And we have to do that. We may fail at the beginning, but it's just like riding a bike. We have to do and practice, and eventually we will go there. And uh, from my experience also in, in my own small way, I can assure all of you, uh, particularly the younger staff, uh, younger members of our community. So please uh, take this note. We can always do better and we can be a good teacher. You mentioned that for that, we have to build a community of, uh, of practitioners. I think that is very, very valuable. We have to share our failures. We have to share our success with others so that we can learn each from each other and grow. I think with that uh, exciting and very valuable uh, contribution from our uh, distinguished speakers today, we have a number of questions in the pipeline. What I will do first, go to the question in the Q&A, and later on, we will open this floor.
let me try to uh, get some of the questions. So question number one, and I will give it to all the panels. Number one question, how do you develop the ethical responsibility among staff and students? So I'll give it to Professor Vedula. <laughs> oh my God, that is the most challenging problem. That is very, very challenging. I think particularly in the, in the COVID era, you know, people have, you know, I mean, I mean, the two, 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 two parts of that, ethics in the profession, when you're actually building a bridge or something, how to be ethical, but the other part, how to, how to be ethical in your personal life is stop cheating. That's very difficult. I don't know what to do about that. It's very, very difficult. You have to do it by setting an example and, uh, and, and it's, 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 it's difficult. I don't know. And there's no magic wands for that. <laughs> okay. Maybe somebody else has a magic wand, but we have to see. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Professor uh, Magat has a magic wand, I guess. Yeah, yeah. As what uh, Professor Vedula mentioned, there's no magic wand here. Uh, mm -hmm. But even if you look at the um, Washington Accord, i.e., graded attributes, uh, if we think about ethics all the while, it's what's in the heart, isn't it? I mean, you cannot see really what's in the heart, but what actually um, is deriving, coming out from the heart is your practice now we can always hide practices i mean if we want to uh, if we are conscious about it but uh, it becomes a habit once it becomes a habit that kind of practice will be demonstrated now here we are talking about if we really want to assess what's in the heart you have to observe them over a period of time there's no two ways about it and you have to be with them so it, it may not be possible in many of our cases unless we actually get involved in in let's say in activity that is long enough that allows you that kind of interaction for example the project base is one that is long enough a semester long probably uh, so that kind of uh, pedagogy if you actually employ you are able to observe and then you need to create some scenarios within that that means to say when they need to solve the problems there are certain scenarios that requires them to actually come up with an ethical solution. Then these are amongst the things that you can actually do. So, but as what has been mentioned, there's no magic wand for that. Uh, it takes time and we have four years to with the students, but not all the time we are with them. Um, but a project based where you may have about a semester long could be the most that you can deal with that, uh, but introducing the scenario within that. I think that's that's one way that we can actually deal with. Most important thing at the moment is they, they also have the right awareness about what is the ethical responsibility. Uh, so we cannot just uh, implement something without introducing those elements within solving the problems. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Megat. I, I think that that was uh, yourself. Way to, to, to approach this difficult problem. It's not easy. I think we all face this issue. And uh, Actually, last, I, was, I was referring more to the other personal problem where students are cheating, copying exams, copying homework assignments, copying from each other. And this is happening all over the world, unfortunately. Especially in the online university era. Yeah. That's a big, big issue, right? Uh, Professor, I think, I uh, would, would, would you add something? Professor, I mean, on the yeah, I, I share the Prof. Megat uh, opinion. Uh, ethical and professional within the uh, within our colleague, basically, uh, there's a set of rules already. So we are already, I mean, so many years practic practicing the thing. So there's no, I think, there's no issue on that one because we know exactly what is the what is uh, the rules, what is et not ethical, what is profession, and so on. But with the students as well, so I think I I just want to to talk about on the practical way as well here. So uh, when when I proposing the uh, discussion in class, uh, solving the problem within the questioning group in the class, and also by doing a group uh, project, for example, then when we are doing it, we can see that uh, some uh, we, we, see, we see different groups of discussions to solve the problem. And we can see somebody just, uh, I mean, 10 just without any discussion, copying the thing. So. Then we can we can approach them. So just to clarify, uh, do you have any something, uh, some 
I mean, distribution to the students and so on. So that one, we is basically we train them to 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 be ethical in such a way in a, in the group discussion. And as for the group this uh, group design uh, project, so that's why I think always it is become important as well to to assess every step of the of the process on of the design. And then we know exactly when they presenting, we know somebody who really doing it and who don't do it at all. So on that time, we, we can we can we can we can investigate it. See, not directly, but say what they are doing in this one and what about how about the other other, other members uh, about his contribution and so so. So therefore, it, it create a, 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 at the end an ethical way to do it. It's one of them lah. So that's why I think it's very important as well to to follow, to guide the students uh, on the whole process of solving the problem, right? Not only to make them understand how to do it, but also uh, teaching them how ethically doing a discussion, uh, I mean, solving the problem in discussion group, for example. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Aminanda. Uh, of course, we welcome uh, questions from the participants. Uh, so please uh, do, do ask your question. And I, I believe uh, you, you can do it. Uh, uh, Professor Al Sheikh, can they ask the question directly? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, anyone want to ask a question can raise a hand and then you can, you can allow him or give him floor. We, we, we highly, highly encourage you. Please do so. Uh, while we are waiting for your question, uh, I, I will pose another question uh, to our panelists, uh, and that is. Nearly 87 million plus learners choosing to study online. How do you see this as a challenge? So who would like to answer this? Is it real? I can start, I can start. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, please. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. In my opinion, in terms of delivery, delivery of the knowledge, there is no differences between online or not online, okay? And the same thing, group pro, uh, group discussions, we can put it online. But the only thing that will be challenging to, to control is when we do an assessment. So especially when the assessment uh, carry a very high weightage. So this kind of thing, I don't think we, uh, we are come up with certain solutions on how to doing it. Uh, historically, we have, yes, we have an assessment like test online, but but uh, when we look at back on those kind of things, basically they are doing it different because, because the campus is spread all, all, all over the places. And each campus has a, a center of the, of the test, test center. So basically the students come to the center. It's not by their own in, in, in their own place. So somebody will be there and it will be online. So uh, the, the point is online study is fine. <clears throat> the studying is nothing, I mean, it will not be uh, big differences in delivering the knowledge, but maybe there's some some difficulties on the on the labs, for example, and also the big problem on the how to control the assessments. The, that one maybe we need to to think about uh, how the technology and uh, new technology we, pro uh, we propose us to get a very I mean a, a fair and uh, a fair assessment for for the students. So Thank you. Yeah, let me jump in yeah, for a minute here. Please, okay, please so, uh, uh, my opinion is that it's you know, almost impossible to go 100% online. Okay, it would not be too productive. I think we, we have, people are trying that, Coursera, et cetera, et cetera. Online, you know, there are lots of th uh, technology out there. Uh, but as I said, this interaction is very important you know, while, while students are learning. Okay, so, uh, so there's a concept of the flipped classroom you know, where, where, you, where you kind of ask the students to do a review material on their own. And then in the classroom, you do the projects, problems, you know, work with each other, discuss. That flipped classroom approach uh, can be used where you can have the online material available to them uh, where they lie on their own and come to the classroom and discuss. And so uh, I, 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 I think that's, uh, see the, of course, it depends also on the age level I think at the undergraduate level, anywhere in the world, you'll find it's uh, it's going to be, be a disaster online education because of this inter need for interaction and uh, between the students. Uh, maybe at the professional level, once you've got one degree and then you really want to learn something on your own because you know that's better for your career, then then it might, it might work. Okay, that's my opinion. Anyway, move on to next. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, Professor Megat, you, your view on online education? I think the main issue is actually integrity and security as far as online uh, learning is concerned. Information or knowledge can easily be obtained. But when we talk about assessment, then how do you ensure integrity and how do you ensure really security of the assessment? Um, most of the time, uh, we have been saying that if it is an open-ended learning, that means uh, open-ended problems, uh, most likely that will help to alleviate uh, some of the issues that we may get because there's no one single answer. But having said that, uh, you do find, uh, especially at the undergraduate levels, uh, for example, there were cases when you know, the, when the exam is on, even though it is an open-ended, uh, you find that question is already, for example, in chemical engineering, it's already in the website on check, uh, asking for solution on the spot. And there are people who actually submit the solution at that, that time, and they just cut and paste. So these are situations where, you know, you, you, you just cannot ensure that uh, security and integrity is actually being managed well. Um, that's why 100% or even 80% for that matter is not something that would be welcome as far as uh, learning is concerned at the undergraduate levels. That's my opinion for, for now. Thank, thanks very much, uh, Professor Megat. I, I think we have the first questioner. So, Professor Lal Mohan, would you, would you please? Uh... Oh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, am, am I audible? Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, actually, I am uh, Dr. Lal Mohan Baral from Arsenal University of Science and Technology. So um, my question actually, uh, in this digital era, actually, the knowledge is increasing day by day. It's vast uh, source of knowledge we have. But during our classroom, um, classroom teaching, it is not possible to give all the uh, essence of knowledge and uh, to the students. So what is the effective way to give more feedback or more, uh, uh, you know, that a student can get the more essence of knowledge from, from the different, you know, source of knowledge. Is there any effective way to our method? I, I'll respond to that first. Okay, okay, sir. okay uh, Professor Mohan. Um, yeah. When I talked about the dynamic classroom, right, yes. where you have to give a lecture for 10 minutes and engage students in activities, I, I immediately get this reaction from the faculty saying that if I do these things, I cannot cover my, can finish my curriculum, the content. Okay, so the so, so 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 just covering content is not enough. They have to understand what the hell you're talking about, right? And, and then if you look at some of the ABET and uh, other outcome, you know, outcomes, one of the outcomes is lifelong learning. They have to learn because knowledge is going to become obsolete after four years and they have to continue to learn and therefore you teach them to learn on their own. So take part of a curriculum that you can learn, that they can learn on their own, let them learn it, give them a quiz on it and use the rest of the time to go into depth about some concepts that they will have a tough time understanding themselves. Okay, thank you, sir. Is, is there any opinion from other panelists, sir? No, I tend to agree with uh, Professor Vedder. Um, that's one of the reasons why we have researched the literature. I mean, if you really want to give the contents, I don't think uh, you'll have enough time to give the contents. It's, I mean, it's just so huge, the amount of information that you can get. Uh, but at the end of the day is the students will have to actually do a little bit of research. Uh, they will need to actually look at all those contents and uh, tie it up with the concept that you actually are bringing in. So you must remember sometimes uh, there is always this issue whereby uh, we say that we allow students to take charge. But if we find that they are actually diverting from what we aimed, that means we must know the objective in the first place, right? If you think that they are diverting, then you have to bring them back. So how do you bring them back? That's where the skill comes in. Uh, when you always ask them to consider certain things that they may not have considered. I think these are things, I mean, it's more of a skill of the academic staff who can actually facilitate the whole process to bring them back to the right track. So information is a lot, but it's how that you allow them to actually go through them. But if they don't get it, bring them back. 
think that's uh, probably the best way to actually deal with that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Megan. My, ans my answer is basically... Uh, I mean, uh, yes, yeah, please, yeah. sir. sir so please. My answer is basically, uh, we cannot teach every, everything in, in the class. So what is is what is essential is the basic the the the, the basic knowledge on that particular module, for example, a particular project, right? So uh, with this, basically, we just strengthen the basics, and then the students uh, later on will will do uh, will do the the remaining. Yeah, right? So how then we try to input in this case a new uh, knowledge on the on that area? So one way to do it. So once we give the basic, basically the basic will be the same, right? Either you have new thing in, uh, come into within the time, but the basic knowledge is will be the same. So we do so. Well, what I do normally just teaching the basics. The content is there, but the basic of the other contents, and then we, we can we can we can we can uh, assess the student with the whatever new uh, on on our time now. Right, but solving with the basic knowledge that we know. So that's why I think again here the the group discussion is very important. So the dynamic class is very important, but the student has to grasp the basic knowledge first, which is I think common for 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 a certain module, uh, whatever the 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 new the new uh, knowledge come in into it. Okay, thank you very much for your valuable feedback, sir. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, Professor Borar. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a few minutes left. I have one question. Uh, let me read it out. Should we consider the blended learning methods for any optimum teaching and learning ecosystem? What could be the justification? So the question is about blended learning. What is your opinion? our distinguished members of the panel. Any thought on this? I think we have talked about some type of blended learning, maybe one overall comprehensive answer. Yeah, if I can just start. I think uh, in this age of digitalization of knowledge and all those, you do find that uh, we are actually exposed to lots of information and so on. Uh, so blended learning is actually one of those that will help us, or actually not only us, but actually is helping the learners more in ensuring that uh, they will have to do their part. That means they have to do the pre-preparation before they really come to classes. So when you blend it, that means to say, there are aspects that you can allow them to do on their own, and they come back. Uh, and these can be the, the virtual platform that we've been talking about. So more and more of the digital technology could actually be introduced there. Um, and it actually reduces in terms of the time taken to actually learn. And that's where the blended learning is helping. Uh, but on the other hand, as I did mention just now, um, if we can ensure integrity and security, that is also another aspect to be considered because uh, at the end of the day, if we do not, uh, one of the issues that I see is that when we do this, maybe some will just rely on others, right? They don't actually do it, but they rely on others and the same thing will still happen because as far as information is concerned, these are readily available. Thank you. So yeah, uh, the, 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 the point goes back to what I started about the teachers learning how to teach. If they, if they have to teach in a blended mode, they have to learn how to teach effectively in that mode to make sure that the students actually are doing what they have to do on their own. And, and, and that's not easy. I'm just gonna stop there. Teach the teacher how to teach. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Uh, we have one minute left. And if there is no burning question from our audience, so I will now get back to uh, Professor Al Sheikh. But before that, I must thank uh, all three members of the panel Professor Megat, Professor Aminanda, and Professor Vedula.
for this wonderful sharing of your this uh, of your experience and personally I, I feel privileged to to join your session so thank you so much uh, i give it back to uh, professor al sheikh thank, thank you, you Sheikh. good job of moderating you did an excellent job thank you, <laughs> thank you so much uh, professor al sheikh thank you very much uh, professor hasib uh, you have been yeah very, very, you, you did a very nice job and I would like to repeat uh, our gratefulness to uh, Professor Megat, Professor Yulfian, and Professor Krishna again for the very nice, very useful discussion.